VO2 max is the greatest predictor of lifespan. We have two avenues or areas to push on to improve our VO2 max. We have our stroke volume and our So there's a lot of ways we go about improving both of them. We know we need to increase the strength of the left ventricle as a starting place. If we do that, that will allow or actually produce and result in an increase in stroke volume. So what does that mean for training? Well, fundamentally, outside of things like exercise technique and timing and nutrition and all that other stuff, if we're just talking about the background physiology, we have two avenues or areas to push on to improve our VO2 max. We have our stroke volume and our AVO2 difference. So there's a lot of ways we go about improving both of them. I am of the opinion that you need to train across a wide spectrum of exercise intensities to optimize both factors. If you in fact look at classic training logs of endurance athletes, uh, going back to even what we know about Oscars training, they are typically gonna spend something like 70% or so of their time at a low intensity. What's that mean exactly? Mm, depends on the athlete, but you're probably talking about something like between 60 to 80, maybe up to 82% of their heart rate peak. Most of their time is there. I'll explain why in a second. Then you've got another additional maybe 20 to 25% of your time being spent at a moderate intensity, typically something like, again, 82 to 90 or so percent of your heart rate peak. And then three to maybe 6% of the time at the remaining higher heart rate. So this is 92, 93% or so plus. The reason I'm giving you kind of rough guidelines there is every scientific paper has those zones, if you will, a little bit differently. All kinds of different endurance coaches historically have set different landmarks. And so there's no exact numbers there. And so as a very rough guideline, I think it is very safe to assume some split like that should be highly effective at improving your VO2 max. What's that mean in terms of exercises? Well, actually it's entirely up to you. VO2 max is, remember, dependent upon how many milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of muscle per minute, which means the more muscles you utilize, the higher the VO2 max is. Uh, if you were to go to get a VO2 max test done, and let's say you were not specifically trained on like a bike. If you were to get that same exact test done on a bicycle versus a treadmill, where you're running versus cycling, the score on the treadmill is going to be about 10% or so higher than it is on the bike. And that's simply because there's a small increase in the amount of muscles involved when it comes to running versus cycling. Now, if you were specifically trained on the bike and you cycle a lot, that may not actually be the case. And in fact, highly endurance trained folks on cy cyclists rather will score higher on a VO2 max test on the bike than they will on a treadmill. But that really is now coming down to test specificity, efficiency, and like other things that are, that's not what we're trying to talk about here. And so generally, the more muscles involved, the more oxygen being utilized, the higher that VO2 max. So when it comes to training, we wanna think about the same thing. The exercise mode, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. It is relevant. You have unlimited options. If you want to bike or swim or row, that's great. If you don't like any of those traditional modalities and you want to use something like an assault bike or pull a sled, run uphill, drag something, those are also incredibly viable options. It's not the exercise per se that determines the adaptation. It's the application of the exercise. Right? The body works and physiology works on a principle called the SAID principle, which stands S-A-I-D, which stands for Specific Adaptation to Imposed Demand. So you put a demand on a tissue to bring in and utilize oxygen at a high rate, it will adapt to that specific demand. So challenging your muscles continuously to bring in and utilize oxygen at a rapid rate is all fundamentally that needs to happen for you to improve that. And so again, the mode of the exercise is not that big of a deal. If you are new to exercise, I would generally recommend you being careful of exercises that involve a lot of eccentric action. So jumping and landing because you're going to get really sore really fast. But if not, feel free to choose whatever exercise modality or a combination of them. Switch it up a little bit. Do some cycling, do some running uphill, jump in the pool, really up to you. The intensity which you do that is more like what I just explained. Look at any amount of research on that. It is very clear steady state lower intensity exercise, especially over time, six months to a year, is generally going to improve VO2 max probably upwards of five to 10%, depending on the person, the training history and other contexts like that. So it's very, very effective and something I have absolutely incorporated more and more into my, both my life personally, as well as my coaching practice. So really important to do that stuff. On the other end of the equation, you can do things at an extremely high intensity for a short bout. Depending on the study you wanna pull here, you can see things like high intensity intervals. This could be a combination of 
30 seconds of maximal exercise, resting 30 seconds, and repeating that anywhere between like four and 12 times can equally improve VO2 max, if not greater and more so than your steady state exercise. Not necessarily meaning high intensity is better. There are some significant downsides and concerns with only doing high intensity exercise. Another thing I've changed my opinion on. And so I think we want to use high intensity exercise. There's clear benefit there. It's fundamentally different though than low intensity exercise. So we're challenging a different part of the system, which is why I am going to argue you should be incorporating both most of the time. It doesn't have to be always in all of your training, but you wouldn't want to leave either one of these things entirely off if the pure goal here is to maximize VO2. The reason is when you do something at a higher intensity, the point of failure in the tissue becomes different. So extending my ability to move at a lower or moderate intensity for a long period of time is challenging different aspects than it is when I ask it to introduce a tremendous amount of fatigue. So I'm now into anaerobic metabolism when I'm going really hard and really fast. I can't use oxygen, so I'm building up a ton of byproducts. And so again, I don't want to make the argument that one higher intensity or low intensity is better than another. I think you should do both. I will make the same argument for moderate intensity. While that isn't as specific and precise in terms of what it's challenging, it's reasonable to build some of that into your equation as well. Another thing you're gonna find commonly in the research is a longer bout of intervals. This is described in a lot of different ways. One example would be something like, let's go, uh, what a classic runner would do is something more like one mile repeats. So run a mile as fast as you can. This is gonna take most folks, you know, six to eight or nine minutes or so. However long it takes you to run that mile, rest that same amount of time. So it's a one to one work to rest ratio. So six minutes of running, six minutes of rest. And then you repeat that again for a total of two or three or perhaps four repetitions. That's a very long workout and the average person would not, not be able to do that. But those of you that are not average and are that are good to high to strong performers listening right now, that's absolutely within your capabilities. In fact, you've probably done it before. It doesn't have to be that extreme. You could use shorter durations, say two minutes, three minutes, four minutes is a very, very common one you'll find in research. So four minutes of all out exercise, four minutes of recovery, repeat it again, two to four times. What's critical to understand here is these work when you're actually achieving a maximum in that time domain. So you can't do four minutes at 70%, rest for four minutes and do that again. That's going to burn you some calories and has other benefits of just making you feel better today and some other stuff like that. But in terms of VO2 max, that's probably not the most efficient thing you can do. So to summarize all of that stuff, spend a good amount of time at a lower intensity. That's going to drive efficiency. Uh, a common adaptation there since it's going to be the highest activity you can do to maximize utilizing fat for fuel. You're still going to be burning primarily carbohydrates. Don't get that confused. Higher intensities are phenomenal, really, really, really time efficient, but they've got consequences as well. They're going to be entirely or mostly anaerobic, which is okay too, because you'll still use the aerobic side of the equation to recover from that. So super important, but there's a price to be paid there. People can run into problems if you're doing too much intensity too often, especially if you're combining this with a normal stressful life. So you're doing this kind of exercise, then you're going right back into your day job, thinking hard, you're working, you're getting back to forth and you're in a kind of a long high stress environment all day. Really, really challenging on the, on the system to be in that high of a stress at all times. So frequency can be as high or as low as you'd like. There are plenty of studies showing kind of the higher intensity stuff done two to three times per week can improve VO2 max. But you can also do the lower intensity stuff every day or a combination. So really you can modify this based on your lifestyle and what's going on. 